Glossary of Ancient Roman Religion, Wikipedia Audio The vocabulary of ancient Roman religion was highly specialized. Its study affords important information about the religion, traditions, and beliefs of the ancient Romans. This legacy is conspicuous in European cultural history in its influence on later juridical and religious vocabulary in Europe, particularly of the Western Church. This glossary provides explanations of concepts as they were expressed in Latin pertaining to religious practices and beliefs, with links to articles on major topics such as priesthoods, forms of divination, and rituals. Forthianims, or the names and epithets of gods, see list of Roman deities. For public religious holidays, see Roman festivals. For temples see the list of ancient Roman temples. Individual landmarks of religious topography in ancient Rome are not included in this list, see Roman temple. The verb abominary was a term of augury for an action that rejects or averts an unfavorable omen indicated by a signum, sign. The noun is abominatio, from which English abomination derives. At the taking of formally solicited auspices, the observer was required to acknowledge any potentially bad sign occurring within the templum he was observing, regardless of the interpretation. He might, however, take certain actions in order to ignore the signa, including avoiding the sight of them, and interpreting them as favorable. The latter tactic required promptness, wit, and skill based on discipline and learning. Thus the omen had no validity apart from the observation of it. Glossary The Aedes was the dwelling place of a god. It was thus a structure that housed the deity's image, distinguished from the templum or sacred district. Aedes is one of several Latin words that can be translated as shrine or temple, see also Delubrum and Phanum. For instance, the Temple of Vesta, as it is called in English, was in Latin an Aedes. See also the diminutive Aedicula, a small shrine. In his work on architecture, Vitruvius always uses the word templum in the technical sense of a space defined through augury, with Aedes the usual word for the building itself. The design of a deity's Aedes, he writes, should be appropriate to the characteristics of the deity. For a celestial deity such as Jupiter, Kylas, Sol, or Luna, the building should be open to the sky an Aedes for a god embodying virtues, such as Minerva, Mars, or Hercules, should be Doric and without frills, the Corinthian order is suited for goddesses such as Venus, Flora, Proserpina, and the Lymphae, and the Ionic is a middle ground between the two for Juno, Diana, and Father Liber. Thus in theory, though not always in practice, Architectural aesthetics had a theological dimension. Pontifex, the College of Pontiffs headed by the Pontifex Maximus, Augurs, Quindecim Viri Sacri Faciendus, the fifteen priests in charge of the Sibylline books, Septemviri Apollonum, the board of seven priests who organized public banquets for religious holidays. The word Aedilus, a public official, is related by etymology, among the duties of the Aediles was the overseeing of public works, including the building and maintenance of temples. The Temple of Flora, for instance, was built in 241 BC by two Aediles acting on Sibylline oracles. The plebeian Aediles had their headquarters at the Aedes of Ceres. In religious usage, agar was terrestrial space defined for the purposes of augury in relation to auspicia. There were five kinds of agar, Romanus, Gabinus, Peregrinus, Hosticus, and Insertus. 
The Agar Romanus originally included the urban space outside the Pomerium and the surrounding countryside. According to Varro, the Agar Gabinus pertained to the special circumstances of the Oppidum of Gabii, which was the first to sign a sacred treaty with Rome. The Agar Peregrinus was other territory that had been brought under treaty. Agar Hosticus meant foreign territory, insertus, uncertain or undetermined, that is, not falling into one of the four defined categories. The powers and actions of magistrates were based on and constrained by the nature of the agar on which they stood, and agar in more general usage meant a territory as defined legally or politically. The agar Romanus could not be extended outside Italy. The focal point of sacrifice was the altar. Most altars throughout the city of Rome and in the countryside would have been simple, open-air structures they may have been located within a sacred precinct, but often without an Aedes housing a cult image. An altar that received food offerings might also be called a mensa, table. Perhaps the best known Roman altar is the elaborate and Greek-influenced Aera Paces, which has been called the most representative work of Augustan art. Other major public altars included the Aera Maxima. A tree was categorized as Felix if it was under the protection of the heavenly gods. The adjective Felix here means not only literally fruitful but more broadly auspicious. Macrobius lists arbors felices as the oak, the birch, the hazelnut, the sorbus, the white fig, the pear, the apple, the grape, the plum, the cornus, and the lotus. The oak was sacred to Jupiter and twigs of oak were used by the Vestals to ignite the sacred fire in March every year. Also among the Felices were the olive tree, a twig of which was affixed to the hat of the Flamen Dialis, and the laurel and the poplar, which crowned the Salian priests. Stativi, stationary, fixed, holidays which recurred on the same date each year, conceptivi, recurring holidays for which the date depended on some other factor, usually the agrarian cycle. They included Compitalia, Paganalia, Cementivi, and Latini, Imperativi, one-off holidays ordered to mark a special occasion, established with an act of octority of a magistrate. Arbors in Felices were those under the protection of Thonic gods or those gods who had the power of turning away misfortune. As listed by Tarchidius Priscus in his lost ostentarium on trees, these were buckthorn, red cornel, fern, black fig, those that bear a blackberry and black fruit, holly, woodland pear, butcher's broom, briar, and brambles. The verb attractare referred in specialized religious usage to touching sacred objects while performing cultic actions. Attractare had a positive meaning only in reference to the actions of the sacerdotes populi romani. It had the negative meaning of contaminate or pollute when referring to the handling of sacred objects by those not authorized, ordained, or ritually purified. The Nemus of Anaparina Nemus Caesarum, dedicated to the memory of Augustus's grandsons Gaius and Lucius, the Nemus Aracinum sacred to Diana, Egeria, and Verbius. A. An augur was an official and priest who solicited and interpreted the will of the gods regarding a proposed action. The augur ritually defined a templum, or sacred space, declared the purpose of his consultation, offered sacrifice, and observed the signs that were sent in return, particularly the actions and flight of birds. If the augur received unfavorable signs, he could suspend, postpone, or cancel the undertaking. Taking the auspices was an important part of all major official business, including inaugurations, senatorial debates, legislation, elections and war, 
and was held to be an ancient prerogative of regal and patrician magistrates. Under the Republic, this right was extended to other magistrates. After 300 BC, plebeians could become augurs. The solicitation of formal auspices required the marking out of ritual space from within which the augurs observed the templum, including the construction of an augural tent or hut. There were three such sites in Rome, on the citadel, on the Quirinal Hill, and on the Palatine Hill. Festus said that originally the auguraculum was in fact the Arx. It faced east, situating the north on the augur's left or lucky side. A magistrate who was serving as a military commander also took daily auspices, and thus a part of camp building while on campaign was the creation of a tabernaculum augural. This augural tent was the center of religious and legal proceedings within the camp. Augurium is an abstract noun that pertains to the augur. It seems to mean variously, the sacral investiture of the augur, the ritual acts and actions of the augurs, augural law, and recorded signs whose meaning had already been established. The word is rooted in the i.e. stem asterisk og, to increase, and possibly an archaic Latin neuter noun asterisk augus meaning that which is full of mystic force. As the sign that manifests the divine will, the augurium for a magistrate was valid for a year, a priest's, for his lifetime, for a temple, it was perpetual. The distinction between augurium and auspicium is often unclear. Auspicia is the observation of birds as signs of divine will a practice held to have been established by Romulus, first king of Rome, while the institution of augury was attributed to his successor Numa. For Servius, an augurium is the same thing as auspicia impetrativa, a body of signs sought through prescribed ritual means. Some scholars think auspicia would belong more broadly to the magistracies and the patra while the augurium would be limited to the rex sacrorum and the major priesthoods. Ancient sources record three augurea, the augurium salutis in which every year the gods were asked whether it was fause to ask for the safety of the Roman people, the augurium canarium, a dog sacrifice to promote the maturation of grain crops held in the presence of the pontiffs as well as the augurs, and the Verni Sira augurea mentioned by Festus, which should have been a springtime propitiary rite held at the time of the harvest. The auspex, plural auspices, is a diviner who reads omens from the observed flight of birds. See auspicia following an auspice. The auspicia were originally signs derived from observing the flight of birds within the templum of the sky. Auspices are taken by an augur. Originally they were the prerogative of the patricians, but the College of Augurs was opened to plebeians in 300 BC. Only magistrates were in possession of the auspicia publica, with the right and duty to take the auspices pertaining to the Roman state. Favorable auspices marked a time or location as auspicious, and were required for important ceremonies or events, including elections, military campaigns, and pitched battles. Abominary Aedes According to Festus, there were five kinds of auspicia to which augurs paid heed, ex saello, celestial signs such as thunder and lightning, Ex avibus, signs offered by birds, ex tripudius, signs produced by the actions of certain sacred chickens, ex quadrupedibus, signs from the behavior of four legged animals, and ex diris, threatening portents. In official state augury at Rome, only the auspicia ex saello and ex avibus were employed. The mythic theology of the poets, or narrative elaboration, the natural theology of the philosophers, or theorizing on divinity among the intellectual elite, 
the civil theology concerned with the relation of the state to the divine. Agar Era Arbor Felix Attractor Augur The taking of the auspices required ritual silence. Watching for auspices was called spectio or server de saello. The appearance of expected signs resulted in nunciatio, or if they were unfavorable obnunciatio. If unfavorable auspices were observed, the business at hand was stopped by the official observer, who declared alio die. The practice of observing bird omens was common to many ancient peoples predating and contemporaneous with Rome, including the Greeks, Celts, and Germans. Auspicia impetrativa were signs that were solicited under highly regulated ritual conditions within the templum. The type of auspices required for convening public assemblies were impetrativa, and magistrates had the right and duty to seek these omens actively. These auspices could only be sought from an auguraculum, a ritually constructed augural tent or tabernacle. Contrast auspicia ablativa Auguraculum the right of observing the greater auspices was conferred on a Roman magistrate holding imperium, perhaps by a lex curiata de imperio, although scholars are not agreed on the finer points of law. A censor had auspicia maxima. It is also thought that the flamens myers were distinguished from the minores by their right to take the auspicium aura, see flamen. Signs that occurred without deliberately being sought through formal augural procedure were auspicia oblativa. These unsolicited signs were regarded as sent by a deity or deities to express either approval or disapproval for a particular undertaking. The prodigy was one form of unfavorable oblativa. Contrast auspicia impetrativa. Private and domestic religion was linked to divine signs as state religion was. It was customary in patrician families to take the auspices for any matter of consequence such as marriages, travel, and important business. The scant information about auspicia privata in ancient authors suggests that the taking of private auspices was not different in essence from that of public auspices, absolute silence was required and the person taking the auspices could ignore unfavorable or disruptive events by feigning not to have perceived them. In matters pertaining to the family or individual, both lightning and extamite yield signs for privati, private citizens not authorized to take official auspices. Among his other duties, the Pontifex Maximus advised privati as well as the official priests about prodigies and their forestalling. In pontifical usage, the verb aver uncare, to avert, denotes a ritual action aimed at averting a misfortune intimated by an omen. Bad omens are to be burnt, using trees that are in the tutelage of underworld or averting gods. Varro says that the god who presides over the action of averting is a Veruncus. A just war was a war considered justifiable by the principles of facial law. Because war could bring about religious pollution, it was in itself nifas, wrong, and could incur the wrath of gods unless iestum, just. The requirements for a just war were both formal and substantive. As a formal matter, the war had to be declared according to the procedures of the IU's facial. On substantive grounds, a war required a just cause, which might include rerum repetitio, retaliation against another people for pillaging, or a breach of or unilateral recession from a treaty, or necessity, as in the case of repelling an invasion. See also use ad bellum. The English word ceremony derives from the Latin ceremonia or caeremonia, a word of obscure etymology first found in literature and inscriptions from the time of Cicero, but thought to be of much greater antiquity. 
its meaning varied over time. Cicero used ceremonia at least 40 times, in three or four different senses, inviolability or sanctity, a usage also of Tacitus, punctilious veneration, in company with cura, more commonly in the plural ceremoniae, to mean ritual prescriptions or ritual acts. The plural form is endorsed by Roman grammarians. Hendrik Wagenvoort maintained that ceremoniae were originally the secret ritual instructions laid down by Numa, which are described as stati et solemnes, established and solemn. These were interpreted and supervised by the College of Pontiffs, Flamens, Rex Sacrorum, and the Vestals. Later, ceremoniae might refer also to other rituals, including foreign cults. These prescribed rites unite the inner subject with the external religious object, binding human and divine realms. The historian Valerius Maximus makes clear that the ceremoniae require those performing them to attain a particular mental spiritual state, and emphasizes the importance of ceremoniae in the dedication and first sentence of his work. In Valerius's version of the Gallic Siege of Rome, the Vestals and the Flamen Quirin Alice rescue Rome's sacred objects by taking them to Caera, thus preserved, the rites take their name from the place. Although this etymology makes a meaningful narrative connection for Valerius, it is unlikely to be correct in terms of modern scientific linguistics. An Etruscan origin has sometimes been proposed. Wagenvoort thought that ceremonia derived from Ceres, dark in the sense of hidden, hence meaning darknesses, secrets. Augurium In his Etymologia, Isidore of Seville says that the Greek equivalent is orgia, but derives the word from karandu, lacking, and says that some think ceremoniae should be used of Jewish observances, specifically the dietary law that requires abstaining from or lacking certain foods. The Kalatoras were assistants who carried out day-to-day -day business on behalf of the senior priests of the state such as the Flamens Myers. A Kalator was a public slave. Festus derives the word from the Greek verb kalene, to call. Auspex at the traditional public rituals of ancient Rome, officiants prayed, sacrificed, offered libations, and practiced augury caput velato, with the head covered by a fold of the toga drawn up from the back. This covering of the head is a distinctive feature of Roman rite in contrast with Etruscan practice or ritus graecus, Greek rite. In Roman art, the covered head is a symbol of pietas and the individual status as a pontifex, augur, or other priest. It has been argued that the Roman expression of piety caput velato influenced Paul S. prohibition against Christians praying with covered heads, any man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Auspicia Auspicia impetrativa Auspicium aura. In classical Latin, Carmen usually means song, poem, ode. In magico religious usage, a Carmen is a chant, hymn, spell, or charm. In essence, a verbal utterance sung for ritualistic purposes, the Carmen is characterized by formulaic expression, redundancy, and rhythm. Fragments from two archaic priestly hymns are preserved, the Carmen Arvale of the Arval Brethren and the Carmen Saliaria of the Salii. The Carmen Seculare of Horus, though self-consciously literary in technique, was also a hymn, performed by a chorus at the Secular Games of 17 BC and expressing the Apollonian ideology of Augustus. A Carmen Malum or Maleficum is a potentially harmful magic spell. A fragment of the Twelve Tables reading S.I. Malum Carmen Incantacit shows that it was a concern of the law to suppress malevolent magic. 
A Carmen Sepul Kral is a spell that evokes the dead from their tombs, a Carmen Venificum, a poisonous charm. In magic, the word Carmen comes to mean also the object on which a spell is inscribed, hence a charm in the physical sense. Castus is an adjective meaning morally pure or guiltless, hence pious, or ritually pure in a religious sense. Castitas is the abstract noun. Various etymologies have been proposed, among them two i.e. stems, asterisk castos meaning he who conforms to the prescriptions of right, or asterisk cas, from which derives the verb cario, I deface, am deprived of, have none. i.e. visha. In Roman religion, the purity of ritual and those who perform it is paramount, one who is correctly cleansed and castus in religious preparation and performance is likely to please the gods. Ritual error is a pollutant, it vitiates the performance and risks the gods' anger. Castus and castitas are attributes of the sacerdos, but substances and objects can also be ritually castus. A priest or officiant who was cinctus gabinus wore his toga bound around the waist in a gabinian cincture, a particular belting for a vestment that was derived from the practice of gabii. This style of fastening left both hands free to perform ritual tasks, as the wearing of the toga usually did not. The cincture accompanied the veiling or covering of the head with a cowl like fold of the toga. Like the conical, Helmet-like headgear worn by priests such as the Salii, the Gabinian cincture was originally associated with warriors, and was worn for a solemn declaration of war. It was also part of Etruscan priestly dress. Clavum figuri was an expression that referred to the fixing or sealing of fate. A nail was one of the attributes of the goddess Necessitas and of the Etruscan goddess Athrupa. According to Livy, every year in the Temple of Norcia, the Etruscan counterpart of Fortuna, a nail was driven in to mark the time. In Rome, the senior magistrate on the Ides of September drove a nail called the Clavus Annalis into the wall of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. The ceremony occurred on the Dies Natales of the Temple, when a banquet for Jupiter was also held. The nail-driving ceremony, however, took place in a templum devoted to Minerva, on the right side of the Aedes of Jupiter, because the concept of number was invented by Minerva and the ritual predated the common use of written letters. The importance of this ritual is lost in obscurity, but in the early Republic it is associated with the appointment of a dictator Clavi Figendi Causat dictator for the purpose of driving the nail, one of whom was appointed for the years 363, 331, 313, and 263 BC. Livy attributes this practice to religio, religious scruple, or obligation. It may be that in addition to an annual ritual, there was a fixing during times of pestilence or civil discord that served as a piaculum. Livy says that in 363, a plague had been ravaging Rome for two years. It was recalled that a plague had once been broken when a dictator drove a ritual nail, and the Senate appointed one for that purpose. The ritual of driving the nail was among those revived and reformed by Augustus who in 1 AD transferred it to the new temple of Mars Ultor. Henceforth a censor fixed the nail at the end of his term. A collegium, plural collegia, was any association with a legal personality. The priestly colleges oversaw religious traditions, and until 300 BC only patricians were eligible for membership. When plebeians began to be admitted, the size of the colleges was expanded. By the late Republic, three collegia wielded greater authority than the others, with the fourth coming to prominence during the reign of Augustus. 
the four great religious corporations were. Augustus was a member of all four collegia, but limited membership for any other senator to one. In Roman society, a collegium might also be a trade guild or neighborhood association, see collegium. The Comitia Calata were non-voting assemblies called for religious purposes. The verb calera, originally meaning to call, was a technical term of pontifical usage, found also in Calendi and Calater. According to Aulus Gellius, these comitia were held in the presence of the College of Pontiffs in order to inaugurate the Rex or the Flamens. The Pontifex Maximus auspiciated and presided, assemblies over which annually elected magistrates presided are never calata, nor are meetings for secular purposes or other elections even with a pontiff presiding. The Comitia Calata were organized by Curii or Centurii. The people were summoned to Comitia Calata to witness the reading of wills, or the oath by which sacra were renounced. They took no active role and were only present to observe as witnesses. Momsen thought the calendar abbreviation QRCF, given once as Q Rex CF and taken as Quando Rex Comitiavit Fos, designated a day when it was religiously permissible for the Rex to call for a comitium, hence the Comitia Calata. The commentaries of the Augurs were written collections probably of the Decreta and Responsa of the College of Augurs. Some scholarship, however, maintains that the commentarii were precisely not the Decreta and Responsa. The commentaries are to be distinguished from the Augurs Libri Reconditi, texts not for public use. The books are mentioned by Cicero, Festus, and Servius Danielis. Livy includes several examples of the Augurs Decreta and Responsa in his history, presumably taken from the Commentarii. The Commentaries of the Pontiffs contained a record of decrees and official proceedings of the College of Pontiffs. Priestly literature was one of the earliest written forms of Latin prose, and included rosters, acts, and chronicles kept by the various collegia, as well as religious procedure. It was often a cultum genus literarum, an arcane form of literature to which by definition only priests had access. The commentarii, however, may have been available for public consultation, at least by senators, because the rulings on points of law might be cited as precedent. The public nature of the commentarii is asserted by Jerzy Lindersky in contrast to Libri Reconditi, the secret priestly books. The commentarii survive only through quotation or references in ancient authors. These records are not readily distinguishable from the Libri Pontificals, some scholars maintain that the terms commentarii and libri for the pontifical writings are interchangeable. Those who make a distinction hold that the libri were the secret archive containing rules and precepts of the Ius Sacrum, texts of spoken formulae, and instructions on how to perform ritual acts, while the commentarii were the responsa and decreta that were available for consultation. Whether or not the terms can be used to distinguish two types of material, the priestly documents would have been divided into those reserved for internal use by the priests themselves, and those that served as reference works on matters external to the college. Collectively, these titles would have comprised all matters of pontifical law, ritual, and cult maintenance, along with prayer formularies and temple statutes. See also Libri Pontificals and Libri Augurales. Coniectura is the reasoned but speculative interpretation of signs presented unexpectedly, that is, of novi res, novel information. These new signs are omens or portents not previously observed, or not observed under the particular set of circumstances at hand. 
Koniekshara is thus the kind of interpretation used for Ostenta and Portenta as constituting one branch of the Etruscan discipline, contrast observatio as applied to the interpretation of Fulgura and Exta. It was considered an ars, a method or art as distinguished from disciplina, a formal body of teachings which required study or training. The origin of the Latin word coniectura suggests the process of making connections, from the verb conitio, participle coniectum. Coniectura was also a rhetorical term applied to forms of argumentation, including court cases. The English word conjecture derives from coniectura. Consecratio was the ritual act that resulted in the creation of an Aedes a shrine that housed a cult image, or an era, an altar. Jerzy Lindersky insists that the consecratio should be distinguished from the inauguratio, that is, the ritual by which the augurs established a sacred place or templum. The consecration was performed by a pontiff reciting a formula from the Libri Pontificals, the pontifical books. One component of consecration was the dedicatio, or dedication, a form of ius publicum carried out by a magistrate representing the will of the Roman people. The pontiff was responsible for the consecration proper. Cicero defined religio as cultus deorum, the cultivation of the gods. The cultivation necessary to maintain a specific deity was that God's cultus, cult, and required the knowledge of giving the gods their due. The noun cultus originates from the past participle of the verb colorado, cholera, colui, cultus, to tend, take care of, cultivate, originally meaning to dwell in, inhabit and thus to tend, cultivate land to practice agriculture, an activity fundamental to Roman identity even when Rome as a political center had become fully urbanized. Cultus is often translated as cult, without the negative connotations the word may have in English, or with the Anglo-Saxon word worship, but it implies the necessity of active maintenance beyond passive adoration. Cultus was expected to matter to the gods as a demonstration of respect, honor, and reverence, it was an aspect of the contractual nature of Roman religion. St. Augustine echoes Cicero's formulation when he declares that religio is nothing other than the cultus of God. Decreta were the binding explications of doctrine issued by the official priests on questions of religious practice and interpretation. They were preserved in written form and archived. Compare Responsum A Delubrum was a shrine. Varro says it was a building that housed the image of a deus, god, and emphasizes the human role in dedicating the statue. According to Varro, the Delubrum was the oldest form of an Aedes, a structure that housed a god. It is an ambiguous term for both the building and the surrounding area ubi aquacurit, according to the etymology of the antiquarian Cincius. Festus gives the etymology of Delubrum as fustem delabratum, strip stake, that is, a tree deprived of its bark by a lightning bolt as such trees in archaic times were venerated as gods. The meaning of the term later extended to denote the shrine built to house the stake. Compare Aedes, Phanum, and Templum. Isidore connected the Delubrum with the verb Diliura, to wash, describing it as a spring shrine, sometimes with a next pool, where people would wash before entering thus comparable to a Christian baptismal font. When a person passed from one gens to another, as for instance by adoption, he renounced the religious duties he had previously held in order to assume those of the family he was entering. The ritual procedure of detestatio sacrorum was enacted before a callate assembly. Dias, God, Dea, 
goddess, plural dia, d or di, gods, plural, or deities, of mixed gender. The Greek equivalent is theos, which the Romans translated with deus. Servius says that deus or dea is a generic term for all gods. In his lost work Antiquitates Rerum Divinarum, assumed to have been based on pontifical doctrine, Varro classified dii as certi, inserti, precipui, or selecti, i.e. deities whose function could be ascertained, those whose function was unknown or indeterminate, main, or selected gods. Compare divus. For etymological discussion, see Deus and Dius. See also List of Roman Deities The devotio was an extreme form of votum in which a Roman general vowed to sacrifice his own life in battle along with the enemy Teutonic deities in exchange for a victory. The most extended description of the ritual is given by Livy, regarding the self-sacrifice of Decius Muse. The English word devotion derives from the Latin. For another votum that might be made in the field by a general, see a vocatio. A Roman emperor s dies imperii was the date on which he assumed imperium, that is, the anniversary of his accession as emperor. The date was observed annually with renewed oaths of loyalty and vota pro salute imperatoris, vows and offerings for the well-being of the emperor. Observances resembled those on January 3, which had replaced the traditional vows made for the Salus of the Republic after the transition to one-man rule under Augustus. The Dies Imperii was a recognition that succession during the Empire might take place irregularly through the death or overthrow of an emperor, in contrast to the annual magistracies of the Republic when the year was designated by the names of consuls serving their one-year term. The Dies Augusti or Dies Augustus was more generally any anniversary pertaining to the imperial family, such as birthdays or weddings, appearing on official calendars as part of imperial cult. To a Dies Caesaris are also found, but it is unclear whether or how it differed from the Dies Augusti. The Dies Lustricus was a rite carried out for the newborn on the eighth day of life for girls and the ninth day for boys. Little is known of the ritual procedure, but the child must have received its name on that day. Funerary inscriptions for infants who died before their dies lustricus are nameless. The youngest person found commemorated on a Roman tombstone by name was a male infant nine days old. Because of the rate of infant mortality, perhaps as high as 40%, the newborn in its first few days of life was held as in a liminal phase, vulnerable to malignant forces. Socially, the child did not exist. The dies lustricus may have been when the child received the bulla, the protective amulet that was put aside when a boy passed into adulthood. A dies natalis was a birthday or more generally the anniversary of a founding event. The Romans celebrated an individual's birthday annually, in contrast to the Greek practice of marking the date each month with a simple libation. The Roman dies natalis was connected with the cult owed to the genius. A public figure might schedule a major event on his birthday, Pompeius Magnus waited seven months after he returned from his military campaigns in the east before he staged his triumph so he could celebrate it on his birthday. The coincidence of birthdays and anniversaries could have a positive or negative significance. News of Decimus Brutus's victory at Mutina was announced at Rome on his birthday, while Caesar's assassin Cassius suffered defeat at Philippi on his birthday and committed suicide. Birthdays were one of the dates on which the dead were commemorated. The date when a temple was founded, or when it was rededicated after a major renovation or rebuilding, was also a dies natalis, and might be felt as the birthday of the deity it housed as well. 
The date of such ceremonies was therefore chosen by the pontiffs with regard to its position on the religious calendar. The birthday or foundation date of Rome was celebrated April 21, the day of the Paralia, an archaic pastoral festival. As part of a flurry of religious reforms and restorations in the period from 38 BC to 17 AD, no fewer than 14 temples had their dies natales moved to another date, sometimes with the clear purpose of aligning them with new imperial theology after the collapse of the Republic. The birthdays of emperors were observed with public ceremonies as an aspect of imperial cult. The Firiale Duranum, a military calendar of religious observances, features a large number of imperial birthdays. Augustus shared his birthday with the anniversary of the Temple of Apollo in the Campus Martius, and elaborated on his connection with Apollo in developing his special religious status. A birthday commemoration was also called a natalicium, which could take the form of a poem. Early Christian poets such as Paulinus of Nola adopted the natalicium poem for commemorating saints. The day on which Christian martyrs died is regarded as their dies natales, see Calendar of Saints. According to Festus, it was wrong to undertake any action beyond attending to basic necessities on a day that was religiosus on the calendar. On these days, there were to be no marriages, political assemblies, or battles. Soldiers were not to be enlisted, nor journeys started. Nothing new was to be started, and no religious acts performed. Aulus Gellius said that dies religiosi were to be distinguished from those that were nefasti. The phrase DM Vischer in augural practice meant that the normal activities of public business were prohibited on a given day, presumably by obnunciatio, because of observed signs that indicated defect. Unlike a dies religiosus or a dies ater, a particular date did not become permanently viciosus, with one exception. Some Roman calendars produced under Augustus and up to the time of Claudius marked January 14 as a dies viciosus, a day that was inherently vitiated. January 14 is the only day to be marked annually and officially by decree of the Roman Senate as viciosus. Elindersky calls this a very remarkable innovation. One calendar, the Fast I Verulani, explains the designation by noting it was the dies natales of Mark Antony, which the Greek historian and Roman senator Cassius Dio says had been declared by Augustus. The emperor Claudius, who was the grandson of Antony, rehabilitated the day. The adjective dyrus as applied to an omen meant dire, awful. It often appears in the feminine plural as a substantive meaning evil omens. Dairy were the worst of the five kinds of signs recognized by the augurs, and were a type of ablative or unsought sign that foretold disastrous consequences. The ill-fated departure of Marcus Crassus for the invasion of Parthia was notably attended by Dairy. In the interpretive etymology of ancient writers, Deary was thought to derive from Deire, the grudges or anger of a god, that is, divine wrath. Deary is an epithet for the Furies, and can also mean curses or imprecations, particularly in the context of magic and related to defictionies. In explaining why Claudius felt compelled to ban the religion of the Druids, Suetonius speaks of it as dyrus, alluding to the practice of human sacrifice. The collective body of knowledge pertaining to the doctrine, ritual practices, laws, and science of Etruscan religion and cosmology was known as the Disciplina Etrusca. Divination was a particular feature of the Disciplina. The Etruscan texts on the Disciplina that were known to the Romans are of three kinds the Libri Harus Piccini, the Libri Fulgurales, and the Libri Rituals. Nicodius Figulus, 
the late Republican scholar and praetor of 58 BC, was noted for his expertise in the Disciplina. Extant ancient sources on the Etrusca Disciplina include Pliny the Elder, Seneca, Cicero, Johannes Lydus, Macrobius and Festus. The adjective divus, feminine diva, is usually translated as divine. As a substantive, divus refers to a deified or divinized mortal. Both dius and divus derive from Indo-European asterisk di woes, Old Latin dia vos. Servius confirms that dius is used for perpetual deities, but divus for people who become divine. While this distinction is useful in considering the theological foundations of imperial cult, it sometimes vanishes in practice, particularly in Latin poetry. Virgil, for instance, mostly uses dius and divus interchangeably. Varro and Atias, however, maintained that the definitions should be reversed. See also Imperial Cult, Divus, Dius, and the Newman. The formula du ut de expresses the reciprocity of exchange between human being and deity, reflecting the importance of gift giving as a mutual obligation in ancient society and the contractual nature of Roman religion. The gifts offered by the human being take the form of sacrifice, with the expectation that the god will return something of value, prompting gratitude and further sacrifices in a perpetuating cycle. The Du Ut De principle is particularly active in magic and private ritual. Du Ut De was also a judicial concept of contract law. Auspicia Ablativa in Pauline theology, du ut de was viewed as a reductive form of piety, merely a business transaction, in contrast to the Christian God's unilateral grace. Max Weber, in The Sociology of Religion, saw it as a purely formalistic ethic. In the elementary forms of religious life, however, Mile Durkheim regarded the concept as not merely utilitarian, but an expression of the mechanism of the sacrificial system itself as an exchange of mutually invigorating good deeds between the divinity and his faithful. The verb efferi, past participle effatus, means to create boundaries by means of fixed verbal formulas. Effatio is the abstract noun. It was one of the three parts of the ceremony inaugurating a templum, preceded by the consulting of signs and the libratio which freed the space from malign or competing spiritual influences and human effects. A site libratus et fatus was thus exorcised and available. The result was a locus inauguratus, the most common form of which was the templum. The boundaries had permanent markers, and when these were damaged or removed, their effatio had to be renewed. The calling forth or summoning away of a deity was an evocatio, from evoco, evocare, summon. The ritual was conducted in a military setting either as a threat during a siege or as a result of surrender, and aimed at diverting the favor of a tutelary deity from the opposing city to the Roman side customarily with a promise of better endowed cult or a more lavish temple. As a tactic of psychological warfare, Evocatio undermined the enemy's sense of security by threatening the sanctity of its city walls and other forms of divine protection. In practice, Evocatio was a way to mitigate otherwise sacrilegious looting of religious images from shrines. Recorded examples of evocations include the transferal of Juno Regina from VI in 396 BC, the ritual performed by Scipio Emilianus in 146 BC at the defeat of Carthage involving Tanit and the dedication of a temple to an unnamed, gender indeterminate deity at Isora Vetus in Asia Minor in 75 BC. 
Some scholars think that Vorchimnus was brought by evocation to Rome in 264 BC as a result of M. Fulvius Flaccus's defeat of the Volsinii. In Roman myth, a similar concept motivates the transferal of the Palladium from Troy to Rome, where it served as one of the Pignora Imperii, sacred tokens of Roman sovereignty. Compare Invocatio, the calling on of a deity. Formal evocations are known only during the Republic. Other forms of religious assimilation appear from the time of Augustus, often in connection with the establishment of the imperial cult in the provinces. Auspicia Privata Evocatio, summons, was also a term of Roman law without evident reference to its magico-religious sense. A site that had been inaugurated, that is, marked out through augural procedure, could not have its purpose changed without a ceremony of reversal. Removing a god from the premises required the correct ceremonial invocations. When Tarquin rebuilt the temple district on the Capitoline, a number of deities were dislodged by Exauguratio, though Terminus and Juventus refused and were incorporated into the new structure. A distinction between the Exauguratio of a deity and an Evocatio can be unclear. The procedure was in either case rare, and was required only when a deity had to yield place to another, or when the site was secularized. It was not required when a site was upgraded. For instance, if an open-air altar were to be replaced with a temple building to the same god. A Avaruncare The term could also be used for removing someone from a priestly office. Compare inauguratio. An adjective, choice, select, used to denote the high quality required of sacrificial victims. Victims are called select because they are selected from the herd and designated for sacrifice, or because they are chosen on account of their choice appearance as offerings to divine entities. The adjective here is synonymous with egregious, chosen from the herd. Macrobius says it is specifically a sacerdotal term and not a poetic epithet. B. Bellamiastum the extra were the entrails of a sacrificed animal, comprising in Cicero's enumeration the gall bladder, liver, heart, and lungs. The extra were exposed for litation as part of Roman liturgy, but were read in the context of the Disciplina Etrusca. As a product of Roman sacrifice, the extra and blood are reserved for the gods, while the meat is shared among human beings in a communal meal. The extra of bovine victims were usually stewed in a pot, while those of sheep or pigs were grilled on skewers. When the deity's portion was cooked, it was sprinkled with mola salsa and wine, then placed in the fire on the altar for the offering. The technical verb for this action was pericere. Fanaticus means belonging to a phanum, a shrine or sacred precinct. Fanatici as applied to people refers to temple attendants or devotees of a cult, usually one of the ecstatic or orgiastic religions such as that of Sibylle, Bolonima, or perhaps Sylvanus. Inscriptions indicate that a person making a dedication might label himself fanaticus, in the neutral sense of devotee. Tacitus uses fanaticus to describe the troop of druids who attended on the Icenian queen Boudicca. The word was often used disparagingly by ancient Romans in contrasting these more emotive rites to the highly scripted procedures of public religion, and later by early Christians to deprecate religions other than their own, hence the negative connotation of fanatic in English. Festus says that a tree struck by lightning is called fanaticus, a reference to the Romano-Etruscan belief in lightning as a form of divine sign. The Gallic bishop Caesarius of Alls, writing in the 5th century, indicates that such trees retained their sanctity even up to his own time, 
and urged the Christian faithful to burn down the arbors fanatici. These trees either were located in and marked a phanom or were themselves considered a phanom. Caesarius is somewhat unclear as to whether the devotees regarded the tree itself as divine or whether they thought its destruction would kill the Newman housed within it. Either way, even scarcity of firewood would not persuade them to use the sacred wood for fuel, a scruple for which he mocked them. C. Ceremonia. Calidor. Capit Velato. Carmen. Castus, Castidas. Cinctus Gabinus. Clavum Figuri. Collegium. Comitia Calida. Commentarii Augurales. Commentarii Pontificum. Coniectura. Consecratio. Cultus. D. A phanom is a plot of consecrated ground, a sanctuary, and from that a temple or shrine built there. A phanom may be a traditional sacred space such as the grove of Diana Nemerensis, or a sacred space or structure for non-Roman religions, such as an Isium or Mithrium. Cognates such as Oscan F. S. N., Umbrian Fesna Fi and Pialinian Fezn indicate that the concept is shared by Italic peoples. By the Augustan period, Phanum, Aedes, Templum, and Delubrum are scarcely distinguishable in usage, but Phanum was a more inclusive and general term. The Phanum, Romano-Celtic Temple, or Ambulatory Temple of Roman Gaul was often built over an originally Celtic religious site, and its plan was influenced by the ritual architecture of earlier Celtic sanctuaries. The masonry temple building of the Gallo-Roman period had a central space and a peripheral gallery structure, both square. Romano-Celtic fana of this type are found also in Roman Britain. The English word profane ultimately derives from Latin profano, before, i.e. outside, the temple, in front of the sanctuary, hence not within sacred ground. Fatidiorum or the contracted form Fatidaeum are the utterances of the gods, that is, prophecies. These were recorded in written form, and conserved by the state priests of Rome for consultation. The fata are both fate as known and determined by the gods or the expression of the divine will in the form of verbal oracles. Fatidaeum is a theme of the Aeneid, Virgil's national epic of Rome. The Sibylline books, composed in Greek hexameters, are an example of written fata. These were not Roman in origin but were believed to have been acquired in only partial form by Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. They were guarded by the priesthood of the Decemviri Sacri Faciendus, ten men for carrying out sacred rites, later fifteen in number, Quindecem Viri Sacri Faciendus. No one read the books in their entirety, they were consulted only when needed. A passage was selected at random and its relevance to the current situation was a matter of expert interpretation. They were thought to contain Fata Rei Publici Eterna, prophecies eternally valid for Rome. They continued to be consulted throughout the imperial period until the time of Christian hegemony. Augustus installed the Sibylline books in a special golden storage case under the statue of Apollo in the temple of Apollo Palatinus. The Emperor Aurelian chastised the Senate for succumbing to Christian influence and not consulting the books. Julian consulted the books regarding his campaign against Persia, but departed before he received the unfavorable response of the college. Julian was killed and the Temple of Apollo Palatinus burned. Phas is a central concept in Roman religion. Although translated in some contexts as divine law, phas is more precisely that which is religiously legitimate, 
or an action that is lawful in the eyes of the gods. In public religion, Fas Est is declared before announcing an action required or allowed by Roman religious custom and by divine law. Fas is thus both distinguished from and linked to Ius, law, lawfulness, justice, as indicated by Virgil's often cited phrase Fas Et Ira Sinant, Fas and Ira allow, which Servius explains as divine and human laws permit for Fas pertains to religion, Ira to the human being. In Roman calendars, days marked F are dies fasti, when it is Fas to attend to the concerns of everyday life. In non-specialized usage, Fas est may mean generally it is permissible, it is right. The etymology of Fas is debated. It is more commonly associated with the semantic field of the verb for, fairy, to speak, an origin pressed by Varro. In other sources, both ancient and modern, Fas is thought to have its origin in an Indo-European root meaning to establish, along with Phanum and Fairy. See also Fasti and Nifas. Decretum a record or plan of official and religiously sanctioned events. All state and societal business must be transacted on dies fasti, allowed days. The fasti were the records of all details pertaining to these events. The word was used alone in a general sense or qualified by an adjective to mean a specific type of record. Closely associated with the fasti and used to mark time in them were the divisions of the Roman calendar. The fasti is also the title of a six-book poem by Ovid based on the Roman religious calendar. It is a major source for Roman religious practice, and was translated into English by J. G. Fraser. In its religious sense, Felix means blessed under the protection or favor of the gods, happy. That which is Felix has achieved the Pax Divum, a state of harmony or peace with the divine world. It is rooted in Indo-European asterisk dull, meaning happy, fruitful, productive, full of nourishment. Related Latin words include femina, woman, fellow, to suckle, and filius, son. See also Felicitas, both an abstraction that expressed the quality of being Felix and a deity of Roman state religion. Delubrum A feria on the Roman calendar is a free day, that is, a day in which no work was done. No court sessions were held, nor was any public business conducted. Employees were entitled to a day off and even slaves were not obliged to work. These days were codified into a system of legal public holidays, the Ferii Publici, which could be. In the Christian Roman Rite a Feria is a weekday on which the faithful are required to attend Mass. The custom throughout Europe of holding markets on the same day gave rise to the word fair. Detestatio Sacrorum in the Roman calendar, a dies festus is a festive or holy day, that is, a day dedicated to a deity or deities. On such days it was forbidden to undertake any profane activity, especially official or public business. All dies festi were thus nefasti. Some days, however, were not festi and yet might not be permissible as business days for other reasons. The days on which profane activities were permitted are profesti. The Fecials, or Fecial Priests. Dias, D-E-A, D, D-I. The Finus, plural fines, was an essential concept in augural practice, which was concerned with the definition of the templum. Establishing fines was an important part of a magistrate's duties. 
Most scholars regard the finus as having been defined physically by ropes, trees, stones, or other markers, as were fields and property boundaries in general. It was connected with the god Terminus and his cult. The fifteen flamens formed part of the College of Pontiffs. Each flamen served as the high priest to one of the official deities of Roman religion, and led the rituals relating to that deity. The flamens were regarded as the most ancient among the sacerdotes, as many of them were assigned to deities who dated back to the prehistory of Latium and whose significance had already become obscure by classical times. The archaic nature of the flamens is indicated by their presence among Latin tribes. They officiated at ceremonies with their head covered by a velum and always wore a filamen, thread, in contrast to public rituals conducted by Greek rite which were established later. Ancient authors derive the word flamen from the custom of covering the head with the filamen, but it may be cognate to Vedic bitrumen. The distinctive headgear of the flamen was the apex. The Brothers of the Field were a college of priests whose duties were concerned with agriculture and farming. They were the most ancient religious sotilitas, according to tradition they were created by Romulus, but probably predated the foundation of Rome. Devotio the adjective Gabinus describes an element of religion that the Romans attributed to practices from Gabii, a town of Latium with municipal status about 12 miles from Rome. The incorporation of Gabinian traditions indicates their special status under treaty with Rome. See Cinctus Gabinus and Agar Gabinus. The hostia was the offering, usually an animal, in a sacrifice. The word is used interchangeably with victima by Ovid and others, but some ancient authors attempt to distinguish between the two. Servius says that the hostia is sacrificed before battle, the victima afterward, which accords with Ovid's etymology in relating the host to the hostiles or enemy, and the victim to the victor. Dies Imperii the difference between the victima and hostia is elsewhere said to be a matter of size, with the hostia smaller. Hostii were also classified by age, lactants were young enough to be still taking milk, but had reached the age to be peri, bidents had reached two years of age or had the two longer incisor teeth that are an indication of age. Dies lustricus Hostii could be classified in various ways. A hostia consultatoria was an offering for the purpose of consulting with a deity, that is, in order to know the will of a deity, the hostia animalis, to increase the force of the deity. Dies Natalis The victim might also be classified by occasion and timing. The hostia precedania was an anticipatory offering made the day before a sacrifice. It was an advance atonement to implore divine indulgence should an error be committed on the day of the formal sacrifice. A preliminary pig was offered as a precedania the day before the harvest began. The hostia precedania was offered to Ceres a day in advance of a religious festival in expiation for negligences in the duties of piety towards the deceased. The hostia precentania was a pig offered to Ceres during a part of the funeral rites conducted within sight of the deceased, whose family was thereby ritually absolved. A hostia succedania was offered at any rite after the first sacrifice had failed owing to a ritual impropriety. Compare Piaculum, an expiatory offering. Dies religiosus. Dies viciosus. Diri. Disciplina Etrusca. Hostia is the origin of the word host for the Eucharistic sacrament of the Western Church. See Sacramental Bread, Catholic Church. See also Votum, a dedication, or a vow of an offering to a deity as well as that which fulfilled the vow. 
Devas. A rite performed by augurs by which the concerned person received the approval of the gods for his appointment or their investiture. The augur would ask for the appearance of certain signs while standing beside the appointee on the auguraculum. In the regal period, inauguratio concerned the king and the major sacerdotes. After the establishment of the Republic, the Rex Sacrorum, the three flamens Myers, the augurs, and the pontiffs all had to be inaugurated. Do you day? E. Efficio. Evocatio. Exauguratio. Eximius. Exta. F. Fanaticus. The term may also refer to the ritual establishing of the augural templum and the tracing of the wall of a new city. The indigitamenta were lists of gods maintained by the College of Pontiffs to assure that the correct divine names were invoked for public prayers. It is sometimes unclear whether these names represent distinct minor entities, or epithets pertaining to an aspect of a major deity's sphere of influence, that is, an indigitation, or name intended to fix or focalize the local action of the god so invoked. Varro is assumed to have drawn on direct knowledge of the lists in writing his theological books, as evidenced by the catalogues of minor deities mocked by the Church Fathers who used his work as a reference. Another source is likely to have been the non-extant work De Indigitamentus of Granius Flaccus, Varro's contemporary. Not to be confused with the De Indigets. The addressing of a deity in a prayer or magic spell is the invocatio, from invoco, invocare, to call upon the gods or spirits of the dead. The efficacy of the invocatio depends on the correct naming of the deity, which may include epithets, descriptive phrases, honorifics, or titles, and arcane names. The list of names is often extensive particularly in magic spells, many prayers and hymns are composed largely of invocations. The name is invoked in either the vocative or the accusative case. In specialized usage pertaining to augural procedure, invocatio is a synonym for precatio, but specifically aimed at averting mela, evil occurrences. Compare evocatio. Phanum. The equivalent term in ancient Greek religion is epicalsis. Pausanias distinguished among the categories of theonym proper, poetic epithet, the epicalsis of local cult, and an epicalsis that might be used universally among the Greeks. Epicalsis remains in use by some Christian churches for the invocation of the Holy Spirit during the Eucharistic prayer. I uses the Latin word for justice, right, equity, fairness, and all which came to be understood as the sphere of law. It is defined in the opening words of the Digesta with the words of Celsus as the art of that which is good and fair and similarly by Paulus as that which is always just and fair. The polymath Varro and the jurist Gaius consider the distinction between divine and human I use essential but divine order is the source of all laws, whether natural or human, so the pontifex is considered the final judge and arbiter. The jurist Ulpian defines jurisprudence as the knowledge of human and divine affairs, of what is just and unjust. Fata Deorum Sacred law or divine law, particularly in regard to the gods' rights pertaining to their property, that which is rightfully theirs. Recognition of the I.U.'s divinum was fundamental to maintaining right relations between human beings and their deities. The concern for law and legal procedure that was characteristic of ancient Roman society was also inherent in Roman religion. See also Pax Deorum. The word lex derives from the Indo-European root asterisk leg, as do the Latin verbs lego, legari, lego, ligare, and lego, legere, 
and the abstract noun religio. Parties to legal proceedings and contracts bound themselves to observance by the offer of sacrifice to witnessing deities. Even though the word lex underwent the frequent semantic shift in Latin towards the legal area, its original meaning of set, formulaic words was preserved in some instances. Some cult formulae are legis, an augur's request for particular signs that would betoken divine approval in an augural rite, or in the inauguration of magistrates and some sacerdotes is named legum dictionary. The formula quaqua leg volat allowed a cult performer discretion in his choice of ritual words. The legis templi regulated cult actions at various temples. Faz in civil law, ritualist sets of words and gestures known as legis actions were in use as a legal procedure in civil cases, they were regulated by custom and tradition and were thought to involve protection of the performers from malign or occult influences. Libation was one of the simplest religious acts, regularly performed in daily life. At home, a Roman who was about to drink wine would pour the first few drops onto the household altar. The drink offering might also be poured on the ground or at a public altar. Milk and honey, water, and oil were also used. The libratio was the liberating of a place from all unwanted or hostile spirits and of all human influences, as part of the ceremony inaugurating the templum. It was preceded by the consulting of signs and followed by the effatio, the creation of boundaries. A site libratus et effatus was exorcised and available for its sacred purpose. Fasti The augural books represented the collective, core knowledge of the augural college. Some scholars consider them distinct from the Commentarii Augurum which recorded the collegial acts of the augurs, including the Decreta and Responsa. The books were central to the practice of augury. They have not survived, but Cicero, who was an augur himself, offers a summary in De Legibus that represents precise dispositions based certainly on an official collection edited in a professional fashion. Felix. The Libri Pontificals are core texts in Roman religion, which survive as fragmentary transcripts and commentaries. They may have been partly analistic, part priestly, different Roman authors refer to them as Libri and Commentarii, described by Livy as incomplete owing to the long time elapsed and the rare use of writing and by Quintilian as unintelligibly archaic and obscure. The earliest were credited to Numa, second king of Rome, who was thought to have codified the core texts and principles of Rome's religious and civil law. See also Commentarii Pontificum. In animal sacrifice, the litatio followed on the opening up of the body cavity for the inspection of the entrails. Litatio was not a part of divinatory practice as derived from the Etruscans, but a certification according to Roman liturgy of the gods' approval. If the organs were diseased or defective, the procedure had to be restarted with a new victim. The importance of Litatio is illustrated by an incident in 176 BC when the presiding consuls attempted to sacrifice an ox only to find that its liver had been inexplicably consumed by a wasting disease. After three more oxen failed to pass the test, the Senate's instructions were to keep sacrificing bigger victims until litatio could be obtained. The point was not that those sacrificing had to make sure that the victim was perfect inside and out, rather, the good internal condition of the animal was evidence of divine acceptance of the offering. The need for the deity to approve and accept underscores that the reciprocity of sacrifice was not to be taken for granted. Feria Festus Fecial Finus
flamen. The distinctively curved staff of an auger, or a similarly curved war trumpet. On Roman coins, the litus is frequently accompanied by a ritual jug or pitcher to indicate that either the money or person honored on the obverse was an auger. In religious usage, a lucus was a grove or small wooded area considered sacred to a divinity. Entrance might be severely restricted, Paulus explains that a capitalis lucus was protected from human access under penalty of death. Legis Sacrati concerning sacred groves have been found on Sipi at Spoleto in Umbria and Lucera in Apulia. See also Nemus. Ludi were games held as part of religious festivals, and some were originally sacral in nature. These included chariot racing and the Venatio, or staged animal human blood sport that may have had a sacrificial element. The wolf priests, organized into two colleges and later three, who participated in the Lupercalia. The most famous Lupercus was Mark Antony. A ritual of purification which was held every five years under the jurisdiction of censors in Rome. Its original meaning was purifying by washing in water. The time elapsing between two subsequent lust rations being of five years the term lustrum took up the meaning of a period of five year. Manubia is a technical term of the Etruscan discipline, and refers to the power of a deity to wield lightning, represented in divine icons by a lightning bolt in the hand. It may be either a Latinized word from Etruscan or less likely a formation from manus, hand, and habira, to have, hold. It is not apparently related to the more common Latin word manubii meaning booty. Seneca uses the term in an extended discussion of lightning. Jupiter, as identified with Etruscan tinea, held three types of manubii sent from three different celestial regions. Stefan Weinstock describes these as Jupiter makes use of the first type of beneficial lightning to persuade or dissuade. Books on how to read lightning were one of the three main forms of Etruscan learning on the subject of divination. One of several words for portent or sign, Miraculum is a non-technical term that places emphasis on the observer's response. Livy uses the word miraculum, for instance, to describe the sign visited upon Servius Tullius as a child, when divine flames burst forth from his head and the royal household witnessed the event. Compare monstrum, ostentum, portentum, and prodigium. Miraculum is the origin of the English word miracle. Christian writers later developed a distinction between miracula, the true forms of which were evidence of divine power in the world, and mere mirabilia, things to be marveled at but not resulting from God's intervention. Pagan marvels were relegated to the category of mirabilia and attributed to the work of demons. Flour mixed with salt was sprinkled on the forehead and between the horns of sacrificial victims, as well as on the altar and in the sacred fire. This mola salsa was prepared ritually from toasted wheat or emmer, spelt, or barley by the Vestals, who thus contributed to every official sacrifice in Rome. Servius uses the words pious and castus to describe the product. The mola was so fundamental to sacrifice that to put on the mola came to mean to sacrifice. Its use was one of the numerous religious traditions ascribed to Numa, the Sabine second king of Rome. A monstrum is a sign or portent that disrupts the natural order as evidence of divine displeasure. The word monstrum is usually assumed to derive, as Cicero says, from the verb monstro show, but according to Vero it comes from Munio, warn. Because a sign must be startling or deviant to have an impact, monstrum came to mean unnatural event or a malfunctioning of nature. 
Suetonius said that at a monstrum is contrary to nature we are familiar with, like a snake with feet or a bird with four wings. The Greek equivalent was teres. The English word monster derived from the negative sense of the word. Compare miraculum, ostentum, portentum, and prodigium. In one of the most famous uses of the word in Latin literature, the Augustan poet Horace calls Cleopatra a fatal monstrum, something deadly and outside normal human bounds. Cicero calls Catalan monstrum at prodigium and uses the phrase several times to insult various objects of his attacks as depraved and beyond the human pale. For Seneca, the monstrum is, like tragedy, a visual and horrific revelation of the truth. Literally the world, also a pit supposedly dug and sealed by Romulus as part of Rome's foundation rites. Its interpretation is problematic, it was normally sealed, and was ritually opened only on three occasions during the year. Still, in the most ancient fasti, these days were marked C suggesting the idea that the whole ritual was a later Greek import. However Cato and Varro as quoted by Macrobius considered them religiosi. When opened, the pit served as a cache for offerings to underworld deities, particularly Ceres, goddess of the fruitful earth. It offered a portal between the upper and lower worlds, its shape was said to be an inversion of the dome of the upper heavens. An adjective derived from Nephes. The gerund of verb fairy, to speak, is commonly used to form derivate or inflected forms of phos. See Virgil's Fandi as genitive of phos. This use has been invoked to support the derivation of phos from i.e. root asterisk bha, Latin fairy. Anything or action contrary to divine law and will is nephes, phos. Nephes forbids a thing as religiously and morally offensive, or indicates a failure to fulfill a religious duty. It might be nuanced as a religious duty not to, as in Festus' statement that a man condemned by the people for a heinous action is say sir. That is, given over to the gods for judgment and disposal. It is not a religious duty to execute him, but whoever kills him will not be prosecuted. Livy records that the patricians opposed legislation that would allow a plebeian to hold the office of consul on the grounds that it was nephes, a plebeian, they claimed, would lack the arcane knowledge of religious matters that by tradition was a patrician prerogative. The plebeian tribune Gaius Canuleus, whose lex it was, retorted that it was arcane because the patricians kept it secret. Usually found with dies, as dies nefasti, days on which official transactions were forbidden on religious grounds. See also nefas, fasti, and fas. Nemus, plural nemora, was one of four Latin words that meant forest, woodland, woods. Lucas is more strictly a sacred grove as defined by Servius as a large number of trees with a religious significance, and distinguished from the silva, a natural forest, saltus, territory that is wilderness, and anemius, an arboretum that is not consecrated. In Latin poetry, anemius is often a place conducive to poetic inspiration, and particularly in the Augustan period takes on a sacral aura. Named Nemora include The chief responsibility of an augur was to observe signs and to report the results. The announcement was made before an assembly. A passage in Cicero states that the augur was entitled to report on the signs observed before or during an assembly and that the magistrates had the right to watch for signs as well as make the announcement prior to the conducting of public business but the exact significance of Cicero's distinction is a matter of scholarly debate. 
Obnunciation was a declaration of unfavorable signs by an augur in order to suspend, cancel, or postpone a proposed course of action. The procedure could be carried out only by an official who had the right to observe omens. The only source for the term is Cicero, a conservative politician and himself an augur, who refers to it in several speeches as a religious bulwark against popularist politicians and tribunes. Its details and workings are unknown, it may have derived from a radical intervention into traditional augural law of a civil lex elia fufia proposed by dominant traditionalists in an attempt to block the passing of popular laws and used from around the 130s BC. Legislation by Clodius as tribune of the plebs in 58 BC was aimed at ending the practice, or at least curtailing its potential for abuse. Obnunciatio had been exploited the previous year as an obstructionist tactic by Julius Caesar as consular colleague Bibulus. That the Clodian law had not deprived all augurs or magistrates of the privilege is indicated by Mark Antony's use of obnuntatio in early 44 BC to halt the consular election. Observatio was the interpretation of signs according to the tradition of the Etruscan discipline, or as preserved in books such as the Libri Augur Ailes. Aheruspex interpreted Fulgura and Exta by observatio. The word has three closely related meanings in augury, the observing of signs by an augur or other diviner, the process of observing, recording, and establishing the meaning of signs over time, and the codified body of knowledge accumulated by systematic observation, that is, unbending rules regarded as objective, or external to an individual's observation on a given occasion. Impetrative signs, or those sought by standard augural procedure, were interpreted according to observatio, the observer had little or no latitude in how they might be interpreted. Observatio might also be applicable to many ablative or unexpected signs. Observatio was considered a kind of science NTIA, or scientific knowledge, in contrast to coniectura a more speculative art or method as required by novel signs. An omen, plural omena, was a sign intimating the future, considered less important to the community than a prodigium but of great importance to the person who heard or saw it. Omens could be good or bad. Unlike prodigies, bad omens were never expiated by public rights but could be reinterpreted redirected or otherwise averted. Sometime around 282 BC, a diplomatic insult formally accepted as omen was turned against Tarentum and helped justify its conquest. After a thunderclap cost Marcellus his very brief consulship he took care to avoid sight of possible bad omens that might affect his plans. Bad omens could be more actively dealt with by countersigns or spoken formulae. Before his campaign against Perseus of Macedon, the consul L. Emilius Paulus was said to have heard of the death of Perseus, his daughter's puppy. He accepted the omen and defeated King Perseus at the Battle of Pydna. In 217 BC the consul Gaius Flaminius disregarded his horse's collapse, the chickens, and yet other omens, before his disaster at Lake Trasimene. Licinius Crassus took ship for Syria despite an ominous call of Conias, which might be heard as Cave Neas. He was killed on campaign. Cicero saw these events as merely coincidental only the credulous could think them ominous. By his time, however, politicians, military magnates and their supporters actively circulated tales of excellent omens that attended their births and careers. See also Abominary and Signum. One form of arcane literature was the Ostentarium, a written collection describing and interpreting signs. Tarchidius Priscus wrote an ostentarium arborarium, 
a book on signs pertaining to trees, and an ostentarium tuscum, presumably translations of Etruscan works. Pliny cites his contemporary Umbricius Melior for an ostentarium aviarium, concerning birds. They were consulted until late antiquity, in the 4th century, for instance, the Haru Spices consulted the books of Tarkidius before the battle that proved fatal to the Emperor Julian. According to Ammianus Marcel Linus, because he failed to heed them. Fragments of Ostentaria survive as quotations in other literary works. According to Vero, an ostentum is a sign so called because it shows something to a person. Suetonius specified that an ostentum shows itself to us without possessing a solid body and affects both our eyes and ears, like darkness, or a light at night. In his classic work on Roman divination, Augusta Bouch, Leclerc thus tried to distinguish theoretical usage of ostenta and portenta as applying to inanimate objects, monstra to biological signs, and prodigia for human acts or movements, but in non-technical writing the words tend to be used more loosely as synonyms. The theory of ostenta, portenta, and monstra constituted one of the three branches of interpretation within the Disciplina Etrusca, the other two being the more specific Fulgura and Exta. Ostenta and portenta are not the signs that augurs are trained to solicit and interpret, but rather new signs, the meaning of which had to be figured out through ratio and coniectura. A religious hierarchy implied by the seating arrangements of priests at sacrificial banquets. As the most powerful, the rex sacrorum was positioned next to the gods, followed by the flamen dialis, then the flamen martialis, then the flamen quirinalis and lastly, the pontifex maximus. The Ordo Sacerdotum observed and preserved ritual distinctions between divine and human power. In the human world, the Pontifex Maximus was the most influential and powerful of all sacerdotes. Paludatus is an adjective meaning wearing the paludamentum, the distinctive attire of the Roman military commander. Varro and Festus say that any military ornament could be called a paludamentum but other sources indicate that the cloak was primarily meant. According to Festus, paludity in the augural books meant armed and adorned. As the commander crossed from the sacred boundary of Rome, he was paludatus, adorned with the attire he would wear to lead a battle and for official business. This adornment was thus part of the commander's ritual investiture with Imperium. It followed upon the sacrifices and vows the commander offered up on the capital, and was concomitant with his possession of the auspices for war. Festus notes elsewhere that the Salian virgins, whose relation to the Salian priests is unclear, performed their rituals paludati, dressed in military garb. Pax, though usually translated into English as peace, was a compact, bargain or agreement. In religious usage, the harmony or accord between the divine and human was the Pax Deorum or Pax Divum. Pax Deorum was only given in return for correct religious practice. Religious error and negligence led to divine disharmony and ira Deorum. A piaculum is an expiatory sacrifice, or the victim used in the sacrifice, also, an act requiring expiation. Because Roman religion was contractual, a piaculum might be offered as a sort of advance payment, the Arval Brethren, for instance, offered a piaculum before entering their sacred grove with an iron implement, which was forbidden, as well as after. The pig was a common victim for a piaculum. The Augustan historian Livy says P. Decius Muse is like a piaculum when he makes his vow to sacrifice himself in battle. The origin of the English word pious, 
Pius is found in Valskian as Paham Estu, Umbrian as Pahas and Oscan as Pahat, from the Proto-Indo-European root asterisk Kiai. In Latin and other Italic languages, the word seems to have meant that which is in accord with divine law. Later it was used to designate actions respectful of divine law and even people who acted with respect towards gods and godly rules. The pious person strictly conforms his life to the I use divinum. Dutiful is often a better translation of the adjective than pious. Pious is a regular epithet of the Roman founding hero Aeneas in Virgil S. Aeneid. See also Pietas, the related abstract noun. Pietas, from which English piety derives, was the devotion that bound a person to the gods, to the Roman state, and to his family. It was the outstanding quality of the Roman hero Aeneas to whom the epithet pious is applied regularly throughout the Aeneid. A verb of unknown etymology meaning to consecrate. The pontifex was a priest of the highest ranking college. The chief among the pontifex was the pontifex maximus. The word has been considered as related to pons, bridge, either because of the religious meaning of the pons sublicius and its ritual use or in the original i.e. meaning of way. Pontifex in this case would be the opener of the way corresponding to the Vedic Adharvayu, the only active and moving sacerdos in the sacrificial group who takes his title from the figurative designation of liturgy as a way. Another hypothesis considers the word as a loan from Sabine language in which it would mean member of a college of five people, from Oscoumbrian Ponte, five. This explanation takes into account the fact that the college was established by Sabine King Numa Pompilius and the institution is italic, the expressions Pontus and Pomperius found in the Aguvine tablets may denote a group or division of five or by five. The pontifex would thence be a member of a sacrificial college known as Pomperia. The Pope was one of the lesser rank officiants at a sacrifice. In depictions of sacrificial processions, he carries a mallet or axe with which to strike the animal victim. Literary sources in late antiquity say that the Pope was a public slave. See also Victim Arius. Fratra Arvels The verb pariser had the specialized religious meaning to offer as a sacrifice, especially to offer the sacrificial entrails to the gods. Both Exta Pariser and Exta Dare referred to the process by which the entrails were cooked, cut into pieces, and burned on the altar. The Arvel brethren used the term extraretary, to return the entrails, that is, to render unto the deity what has already been given as due. A portentum is a kind of sign interpreted by a haruspex, not an augur, and by means of coniectura rather than observatio. Portentum is a close but not always exact synonym of ostentum, prodigium, and monstrum. Cicero uses portentum frequently in his treatise De Divinatione where it seems to be a generic word for prodigies. The word could also refer in non-technical usage to an unnatural occurrence without specific religious significance, for instance, Pliny calls an Egyptian with a pair of non-functional eyes on the back of his head a portentum. Varro derives portentum from the verb portended because it portends something that is going to happen. In the schema of a bouch, Leclerc, portenta, and ostentat are the two types of signs that appear in inanimate nature, as distinguished from the monstrum, prodigia, and amiraculum, a non-technical term that emphasizes the viewer's reaction. The sense of portentum has also been distinguished from that of ostentum by relative duration of time, with the ostentum of briefer manifestation. G. Although the English word portent derives from portentum and may be used to translate it, 
Other Latin terms such as ostentum and prodigium will also be found translated as portent. Portentum offers an example of an ancient Roman religious term modified for Christian usage, in the Christian theology of miracles, a portentum occurring by the will of the Christian God could not be regarded as contrary to nature, thus Augustine specified that if such a sign appeared to be unnatural, it was only because it was contrary to nature as known by human beings. The precatio was the formal addressing of the deity or deities in a ritual. The word is related by etymology to prex, prayer, and usually translated as if synonymous. Pliny says that the slaughter of a sacrificial victim is ineffectual without precatio, the recitation of the prayer formula. Priestly texts that were collections of prayers were sometimes called precations. Gabinus. Two late examples of the Precatio are the Precatio Terrae Matris and the Precatio Omnium Urbarum, which are charms or carmina written metrically, the latter attached to the medical writings attributed to Antonius Musa. Diri Precations were dire prayers, that is, imprecations or curses. H. Hostia. I. Inauguratio. Indigitamenta. Inaugural procedure, precatio is not a prayer proper, but a form of invocation recited at the beginning of a ceremony or after accepting an ablative sign. The precatio maxima was recited for the augurium salutis, the ritual conducted by the augurs to obtain divine permission to pray for Rome's security. In legal and rhetorical usage, precatio was a plea or request. Prex, prayer, usually appears in the plural, prex. Within the tripartite structure that was often characteristic of formal ancient prayer, prex would be the final expression of what is sought from the deity, following the invocation and a narrative middle. A legitimate request is an example of bony prex. Good prayer. Tacitai prex are silent or sato voci prayers as might be used in private ritual or magic. Prex with a negative intent are described with adjectives such as thiestia, funste, infelices, neferii, or diri. In general usage, prex could refer to any request or entreaty. The verbal form is precur, precari, pray, entreat. The Umbrian cognate is persclu, supplication. The meaning may be I try and obtain by uttering appropriate words what is my right to obtain. It is used often in association with quiso in expressions such as te precur quisoc, I pray and beseech you, or press quisit, he seeks by means of prayer. In Roman law of the imperial era, Prex referred to a petition addressed to the emperor by a private person. Prodigia were unnatural deviations from the predictable order of the cosmos. A prodigium signaled divine displeasure at a religious offense and must be expiated to avert more destructive expressions of divine wrath. Compare ostentum and portentum signs denoting an extraordinary inanimate phenomenon, and monstrum, and miraculum, an unnatural feature in humans. Prodigies were a type of auspicia ablativa, that is, they were thrust upon observers, not deliberately sought. Suspected prodigies were reported as a civic duty. A system of official referrals filtered out those that seemed patently insignificant or false before the rest were reported to the Senate, who held further inquiry, this procedure was the procuratio prodigorum. Prodigies confirmed as genuine were referred to the pontiffs and augurs for ritual expiation. For particularly serious or difficult cases, the Decemviri Sacri Faciendas could seek guidance and suggestions from the Sibylline books. The number of confirmed prodigies rose in troubled times. In 207 BC, 
During one of the worst crises of the Punic Wars, the Senate dealt with an unprecedented number, the expiation of which would have involved at least 20 days of dedicated rites. Major prodigies that year included the spontaneous combustion of weapons, the apparent shrinking of the sun's disk, two moons in a daylit sky, a cosmic battle between sun and moon, a rain of red-hot stones, a bloody sweat on statues, and blood in fountains and on ears of corn. These were expiated by the sacrifice of greater victims. The minor prodigies were less warlike but equally unnatural, sheep became goats, a hen became a cock, and vice versa. The minor prodigies were duly expiated with lesser victims. The discovery of a hermaphroditic four-year-old child was expiated by its drowning in a holy procession of twenty-seven virgins to the temple of Juno Regina, singing a hymn to avert disaster, a lightning strike during the hymn rehearsals required further expiation. Religious restitution was proved only by Rome's victory. The expiatory burial of living human victims in the Forum Boreum followed Rome's defeat at Cannae in the same wars. In Livy's account, Rome's victory follows its discharge of religious duties to the gods. Livy remarked the scarcity of prodigies in his own day as a loss of communication between gods and men. In the later Republic and thereafter, the reporting of public prodigies was increasingly displaced by a new interest in signs and omens associated with the charismatic individual. Literally, in front of the shrine, therefore not within a sacred precinct, not belonging to the gods but to humankind. An adjective of augural terminology meaning favorable. From pro before and Peter seek, but originally fly. It implies a kind of favorable pattern in the flight of birds, i.e. flying before the person who is taking the auspices. Synonym Secundus The pulviner was a special couch used for displaying images of the gods, that they might receive offerings at ceremonies such as the lectisternium or supplicatio. In the famous lectisternium of 217 BC, on orders of the Sibylline books, six pulvinaria were arranged, each for a divine male-female pair. By extension, pulviner can also mean the shrine or platform housing several of these couches and their images. At the Circus Maximus, the couches and images of the gods were placed on an elevated pulviner to watch the games. The wife of the Rex Sacrorum who served as a high priestess with her own specific religious duties. The word religio originally meant an obligation to the gods, something expected by them from human beings or a matter of particular care or concern as related to the gods. In this sense, religio might be translated better as religious scruple than with the English word religion. One definition of religio offered by Cicero is cultus deorum, the proper performance of rites in veneration of the gods. Religio among the Romans was not based on faith, but on knowledge, including, an especially correct practice. Religio was the pious practice of Rome's traditional cults, and was a cornerstone of the Mos Maorum the traditional social norms that regulated public, private, and military life. To the Romans, their success was self-evidently due to their practice of proper, respectful religio, which gave the gods what was owed them and which was rewarded with social harmony, peace, and prosperity. Religious law maintained the proprieties of divine honors, sacrifice and ritual. Impure sacrifice and incorrect ritual were visha, excessive devotion, fearful groveling to deities, and the improper use or seeking of divine knowledge were superstitio, neglecting the religiones owed to the traditional gods was atheism, a charge leveled during the empire at Jews, Christians, and Epicureans. 
Any of these moral deviations could cause divine anger and therefore harm the state. See Religion in Ancient Rome Religiosus was something pertaining to the gods or marked out by them as theirs, as distinct from Caesar, which was something or someone given to them by humans. Hence, a graveyard was not primarily defined as Caesar but a locus religiosus, because those who lay within its boundaries were considered belonging to the Dimanes. Places struck by lightning were taboo because they had been marked as religiosus by Jupiter himself. See also Caesar and Sanctus. Residential divinity were divine affairs, that is, the matters that pertain to the gods and the sphere of the divine in contrast to residential humani human affairs. Rem divinum facera, to do a divine thing simply meant to do something that pertained to the divine sphere, such as perform a ceremony or rite. The equivalent Etruscan term is Isna. The distinction between human and divine residential was explored in the multi-volume Antiquitates Rerum Humanarum et Divinarum, one of the chief works of Vero. It survives only in fragments but was a major source of traditional Roman theology for the Church Fathers. Varro devoted 25 books of the Antiquitates to residential humani and 16 to residential divini. His proportional emphasis is deliberate, as he treats cult and ritual as human constructs. Varro divides residential divini into three kinds. The schema is Stoic in origin, though Varro has adapted it for his own purposes. Residential divinity is an example of ancient Roman religious terminology that was appropriated for Christian usage, for St. Augustine, residential divina is a divine reality as represented by a sacrum signum such as a sacrament. Responsa were the responses, that is, the opinions and arguments, of the official priests on questions of religious practice and interpretation. These were preserved in written form and archived. Compare Decretum The Rex Sacrorum was a senatorial priesthood reserved for patricians. Although in the historical era the Pontifex Maximus was the head of Roman state religion, Festus says that in the ranking of priests, the Rex Sacrorum was of highest prestige, followed by the Flamens Myers. Although ritus is the origin of the English word rite via ecclesiastical Latin, in classical usage ritus meant the traditional and correct manner, that is, way, custom. Festus defines it as a specific form of mos, ritus is the proven way in the performance of sacrifices. The adverb right means in good form, correctly. This original meaning of ritus may be compared to the concept of t. In Vedic religion, a conceptual pairing analogous to Latin fas and I use. For Latin words meaning ritual or rite, see sacra, ceremoniae, and religiones. A small number of Roman religious practices and cult innovations were carried out according to Greek rite, which the Romans characterized as Greek in origin or manner. A priest who conducted Ritu Greco wore a Greek-style fringed tunic, with his head bare or laurel wreathed. By contrast, in most rites of Roman public religion, an officiant wore the distinctively Roman toga specially folded to cover his head. Otherwise, Greek rite seems to have been a somewhat indefinite category, used for prayers uttered in Greek, and Greek methods of sacrifice within otherwise conventionally Roman cult. Roman writers record elements of Ritus Graecus in the cult to Hercules at Rome's Aram Maxima, which according to tradition was established by the Greek king Evander even before the city of Rome was founded at the site. It thus represented one of the most ancient Roman cults. 
Greek elements were also found in the Saturnalia held in honor of the Golden Age deity Saturn, and in certain ceremonies of the Ludi Seculares. A Greek rite to Ceres was imported from Magna Graecia and added to her existing Aventine cult in accordance with the Sibylline books, ancient oracles written in Greek. Official rites to Apollo are perhaps the best illustration of the Graecus Ritus in Rome. The Romans regarded Ritus Graecus as part of their own Mosma Orum, and not as novus aut externus Ritus, novel or foreign rite. The thorough integration and reception of rite labeled Greek attests to the complex, multi ethnic origins of Rome's people and religious life. Sakelum, a diminutive from Caesar, is a shrine. Varro and Varius Flaccus give explanations that seem contradictory, the former defining a Sakelum in its entirety as equivalent to a cella, which is specifically an enclosed space and the latter insisting that a sacellum had no roof. The sacellum, notes J. R. G. R. Pike, was both less complex and less elaborately defined than a temple proper. Each curia had its own sacellum. Caesar describes a thing or person given to the gods, thus sacred to them. Human beings had no legal or moral claims on anything Caesar. Caesar could be highly nuanced, Varro associates it with perfection. Through association with ritual purity, Caesar could also mean sacred, untouchable, inviolable. Anything not Caesar was profanum, literally, in front of the shrine, therefore not belonging to it or the gods. A thing or person could be made Caesar or could revert from Caesar to profanum, only through lawful rites performed by a pontiff on behalf of the state. Part of the Ver Sacrum sacrificial vow of 217 BC stipulated that animals dedicated as Caesar would revert to the condition of profanum if they died through natural cause or were stolen before the due sacrificial date. Similar conditions attached to sacrifices in archaic Rome. A thing already owned by the gods or actively marked out by them as divine property was distinguished as religiosus, and hence could not be given to them or made Caesar. Persons judged Caesar under Roman law were placed beyond further civil judgment, sentence and protection, their lives, families and properties were forfeit to the gods. A person could be declared Caesar who harmed a plebeian tribune failed to bear legal witness, failed to meet his obligations to clients, or illicitly moved the boundary markers of fields. It was not a religious duty to execute a homo sacer, but he could be killed with impunity. Dies sacri were nefasti, meaning that the ordinary human affairs permitted on dies profani were forbidden. Caesar was a fundamental principle in Roman and Italic religions. In Oscan, related forms are sacro, sacred, and sacrum, sacrificial victim. Oscan sacriculum is cognate with Latin sacellum, a small shrine, as Oscan sacrator is with Latin sacrator, consecrer, consecrated. The sacerdos is one who performs a sacred action or renders a thing sacred, that is, a priest. A sacerdos was any priest or priestess, from asterisk sacro do ts, the one who does the sacred act. There was no priestly caste in ancient Rome, and in some sense every citizen was a priest in that he presided over the domestic cult of his household. Senators, magistrates, and the decurions of towns performed ritual acts, though they were not sacerdotes per se. The sacerdos was one who held the title usually in relation to a specific deity or temple. See also Collegium and Flamen. Sacra are the traditional cults, either publica or privata, both of which were overseen by the College of Pontiffs. 
The Sacra Publica were those performed on behalf of the whole Roman people or its major subdivisions, the tribes, and curiae. They included the Sacra Pro Populo, rights on behalf of the Roman people, i.e., all the Ferii Publici of the Roman calendar year and the other feasts that were regarded of public interest, including those pertaining to the hills of Rome, to the Pagi and Curii, and to the Sacella, shrines. The establishment of the Sacra Publica is ascribed to King Numa Pompilius, but many are thought to be of earlier origin, even predating the founding of Rome. Thus Numa may be seen as carrying out a reform and a reorganization of the Sacra in accord with his own views and his education. Sacra Publica were performed at the expense of the state, according to the dispositions left by Numa, and were attended by all the senators and magistrates. Sacra Privata were particular to a gens, to a family, or to an individual, and were carried out at the expense of those concerned. Individuals had sacra on dates peculiar to them, such as birthdays, the dies lustricus, and at other times of their life such as funerals and expiations, for instance of fulgurations. Families had their own sacra in the home or at the tombs of their ancestors, such as those pertaining to the lares, manes, and panades of the family, and the parentalia. These were regarded as necessary and imperishable, and the desire to perpetuate the family's sacra was among the reasons for adoption in adulthood. In some cases, the state assumed the expenses even of sacra privata, if they were regarded as important to the maintenance of the Roman religious system as a whole, see Sacra Gentilicia following. Sacra Gentilicia were the private rites that were particular to a gens. These rites are related to a belief in the shared ancestry of the members of a gens, since the Romans placed a high value on both family identity and commemorating the dead. During the Gallic Siege of Rome, a member of the gens Fabia risked his life to carry out the sacred of his clan on the Quirinal Hill. The Gauls were so impressed by his courageous piety that they allowed him to pass through their lines. The Fabian Sacra were performed in Gabine dress by a member of the gens who was possibly named a flamen. There were Sacra of Minerva in the care of the Nautii, and rites of Apollo that the Iulii oversaw. The Claudii had recourse to a distinctive propudial pig sacrifice by way of expiation when they neglected any of their religious obligations. Roman practices of adoption, including so-called testamentary adoption when an adult heir was declared in a will, were aimed at perpetuating the sacra gentilicia as well as preserving the family name and property. A person adopted into another family usually renounced the sacra of his birth in order to devote himself to those of his new family. Sacra gentilicia sometimes acquired public importance, and if the gens were in danger of dying out, the state might take over their maintenance. One of the myths attached to Hercules' time in Italy explained why his cult at the Aram Maxima was in the care of the patrician gens Potitia and the gens Pinaria. The diminution of these families by 312 BC caused the sacred to be transferred to the keeping of public slaves and supported with public funding. The sacra of an Italian town or community might be perpetuated under the supervision of the Roman pontiffs when the locality was brought under Roman rule. Festus defined municipalia sacra as those owned originally, before the granting of Roman citizenship, the pontiffs desired that the people continue to observe them and to practice them in the way they had been accustomed to from ancient times. These sacra were regarded as preserving the core religious identity of a particular people. Sacramentum is an oath or vow that rendered the swearer sacer, given to the gods, in the negative sense if he violated it. Sacramentum also referred to a thing that was pledged as a sacred bond, and consequently forfeit if the oath were violated. 
Both instances imply an underlying sacratio, act of consecration. In Roman law, a thing given as a pledge or bond was a sacramentum. The sacramentum legis actio was a sum of money deposited in a legal procedure to affirm that both parties to the litigation were acting in good faith. If correct law and procedures had been followed, it could be assumed that the outcome was iestum right or valid. The losing side had thus in effect committed perjury, and forfeited his sacramentum as a form of piaculum, the winner got his deposit back. The forfeited sacramentum was normally allotted by the state to the funding of Sacra Publica. The sacramentum militare was the oath taken by soldiers in pledging their loyalty to the consul or emperor. The sacramentum that renders the soldier sacer helps explain why he was subjected to harsher penalties, such as execution and corporal punishment, that were considered inappropriate for civilian citizens, at least under the Republic. In effect, he had put his life on deposit, a condition also of the fearsome sacramentum sworn by gladiators. In the later empire, the oath of loyalty created conflict for Christians serving in the military, and produced a number of soldier martyrs. Sacramentum is the origin of the English word sacrament, a transition in meaning pointed to by Apuleius's use of the word to refer to religious initiation. The sacramentum as pertaining to both the military and the law indicates the religious basis for these institutions. The term differs from ius arendum, which is more common in legal application, as for instance swearing an oath in court. A sacramentum establishes a direct relation between the person swearing and the gods, the ius arendum is an oath of good faith within the human community that is in accordance with ius as witnessed by the gods. A sacrarium was a place where sacred objects were stored or deposited for safe keeping. The word can overlap in meaning with sakelum, a small enclosed shrine, the sakela of the Argii are also called sacraria. In Greek writers, the word is hierophilakian. See sakelum for a list of sacraria. The sacrarium of a private home lent itself to Christian transformation, as a 4th century poem by Osinius demonstrates. In contemporary Christian usage, the sacrarium is a special sink used for the reverent disposal of sacred substances. An event or thing dedicated to the gods for their disposal. The offer of sacrifice is fundamental to religio. See also Caesar and religion in ancient Rome, sacrifice. An adjective first introduced to define the inviolability of the function of the tribunes of the plebs and of other magistrates sanctioned by law legis Valerii Heratii in 449 BC, mentioned by Livy 355, 1. It seems the sacrality of the function the tribune had already been established in earlier times through a religio and a sacramentum, however it obliged only the contracting parties. In order to become a rule that obliged everybody it had to be sanctioned through a sanctio that was not only civil but religious as well, the trespasser was to be declared Caesar, his family, and property sold. Caesar would thus design the religious compact, Sanctus the Law. According to other passages in Livy, the law was not approved by some jurists of the time who maintained that only those who infringed the commonly recognized divine law sacrum sancity could fall into the category of those to be declared sacri. In fact in other places Livy states that only the potstos and not the person of the tribune was defined as sacrosancta. The word is used in Livy 3.19, 10 by the critics of the law in this way. These people postulate they themselves should be sacrosancti, they who do not hold even gods for sacred and saint. The meaning of the word is given as guaranteed by an oath by H. Fugier, 
however Morini thinks it would be more appropriate to understand the first part of the compound as a consequence of the second, Sangsit Tribunum Sacrum the Tribune is sanctioned by the law assessor. This kind of word composition based on an etymological figure has parallels in other IE languages in archaic constructions. The salii were the leaping. A verb meaning to ratify a compact and put it under the protection of a sanctio, penalty, sanction. The formation and original meaning of the verb are debated. Some scholars think it is derived by the IE stem root asterisk sac through a more recent way of word formation, i.e. by the insertion of a nasal n infix and the suffix yo, such as Lithuanian iung iu from IE stem asterisk yug. Then Sancio would mean to render something sacer, i.e. belonging to the gods in the sense of having their guarantee and protection. Some think it is a derivation from the theonym Sancus, the god of the ratification of Phaedra and protection of good faith, from the root Sanku plus suffix io as in Kioincio. In such case the verb would mean an act that reflects or conforms to the function of this god i.e. the ratifying and guaranteeing compacts. Sanctus, an adjective formed on the past participle of verb sancio, describes that which is established as inviolable or sacred, most times in a sense different from that of sacer and religiosus. In fact its original meaning would be that which is protected by a sanction. It is connected to the name of the Umbrian or Sabine founder deity Sancus whose most noted function was the ratifying and protecting of compacts. The Roman jurist Ulpian distinguishes Sanctus as neither sacred nor profane, nor religiosus. Gaius writes that a building dedicated to a god is sacrum, a town's wall and gate are residential sancti because they belong in some way to divine law and a graveyard is religiosus because it is relinquished to the Dimanes. Thus some scholars think that it should originally be a concept related to space i.e. concerning inaugurated places, because they enjoyed the armed protection of the gods. Various deities, objects, places, and people, especially senators and magistrates, can be sanctus. Claudia Quinta is described as a Sanctissima Femina and Cato the Younger as a Sanctus Civis. See also Sanctuary. Later the epithet Sanctus is given to many gods including Apollo Pythias by Navius, Venus, and Tiberinus by Aeneas and Livy. Aeneas renders the Homeric Dia Theaeon as Sancta Dirum. In the early imperial era, Ovid describes Terminus the god who sanctifies land boundaries, as Sanctus, and equates Sancta with Augusta. The original spatial connotation of the word is still reflected in its use as an epithet of the river Tiber and of god Terminus that was certainly ancient, borders are Sancti by definition and rivers used to mark borders. Sanctus as referred to people thus over time came to share some of the sense of Latin castus, pious, and none of the ambiguous usages attached to sacer and religiosus. In ecclesiastical Latin, sanctus is the word for saint, but even in the Christian era it continues to appear in epitaphs for people who had not converted to Christianity. Literally, to watch from the sky, that is, to observe the templum of the sky for signs that might be interpreted as auspices. Bad omens resulted in a report of obnunciatio. A signum is a sign, token, or indication. In religious use, signum provides a collective term for events or things that designate divine identity, activity, or communication, including prodigia, auspicia, omina portenta and ostentat. Silence was generally required in the performance of every religious ritual. The ritual injunction favet linguis, be favorable with your tongues, meant keep silent. In particular, 
silence assured the ritual correctness and the absence of visha, faults, in the taking of the auspices. It was also required in the nomination of the dictator. A Sotilitas was a form of voluntary association or society. Its meaning is not necessarily distinct from collegium in ancient sources, and is found also in Sodalicium, fraternity. The Sotilis is a member of a Sotilitas, which describes the relationship among Sotilis rather than an institution. Examples of priestly sodalitates are the Lupersi, Fischels, Arval Brothers, and Titai, these are also called collegia, but that they were a kind of confraternity is suggested by the distinctive convivial song associated with some. An association of sotilis might also form a burial society, or make religious dedications as a group. Inscriptions record donations made by women for the benefit of Sotiles. Roman Pythagoreans such as Nigidius Figulus formed Sotilicia, with which Ammianus Marcel Linus compared the fellowship of the Druids in Gallo-Roman culture. When the cult of Sibylle was imported to Rome, the eunuchism of her priests the Gauli discouraged Roman men from forming an official priesthood, instead, they joined sodalitates to hold banquets and other forms of traditional Roman cultus in her honor. The sodalitates are thought to originate as aristocratic brotherhoods with cultic duties, and their existence is attested as early as the late 6th or early 5th century BC. The Twelve Tables regulated their potential influence by forbidding them to come in conflict with public law. During the 60s BC, Certain forms of associations were disbanded by law as politically disruptive, and in Ciceronian usage sodalitates may refer either to these subversive organizations or in a religious context to the priestly fraternities. See also Sodales August Ailes. For the Catholic concept, see Sodality. Spectio was the seeking of omens through observing the sky, the flight of birds, or the feeding of birds. Originally only patrician magistrates and augurs were entitled to practice spectio, which carried with it the power to regulate assemblies and other aspects of public life, depending on whether the omens were good or bad. See also Obnunciatio. Sponsio is a formal, religiously guaranteed obligation. It can mean both betrothal as pledged by a woman's family, and a magistrate's solemn promise in international treaties on behalf of the Roman people. The Latin word derives from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning a libation of wine offered to the gods, as does the Greek verb spendu and the noun spondé, spondas, and Hittite spant. In Greek it also acquired the meaning compact, convention, treaty, as these were sanctioned with a libation to the gods on an altar. In Latin, sponsio becomes a legal contract between two parties, or sometimes a fotus between two nations. In legal Latin the sponsio implied the existence of a person who acted as a sponsor, a guarantor for the obligation undertaken by somebody else. The verb is spondio, sponsus. Related words are sponsalia, the ceremony of betrothal, sponsa, fian, e, and sponsus, both the second declension noun meaning a husband to be and the fourth declension abstract meaning suretyship. The ceremonial character of sponsio suggests that Latin archaic forms of marriage were, like the conferiatio of Roman patricians, religiously sanctioned. Dumb? Zill proposed that the oldest extant Latin document, the Duenos inscription, could be interpreted in light of sponsio. Superstitio was excessive devotion and enthusiasm in religious observance, in the sense of doing or believing more than was necessary, or irregular religious practice that conflicted with Roman custom. Religiosity in its pejorative sense may be a better translation than superstition, 
the English word derived from the Latin. Cicero defines superstitio as the empty fear of the gods in contrast to the properly pious cultivation of the gods that constituted lawful religio, a view that Seneca expressed as religio honors the gods, superstitio wrongs them. Seneca wrote an entire treatise on superstitio, known to St. Augustine but no longer extant. Lucretius's famous condemnation of what is often translated as superstition in his Epicurean didactic epic De Rerum Natura is actually directed at religio. Before the Christian era, superstitio was seen as a vice of individuals. Practices characterized as magic could be a form of superstitio as an excessive and dangerous quest for personal knowledge. By the early 2nd century AD, religions of other peoples that were perceived as resistant to religious assimilation began to be labeled by some Latin authors as superstitio, including Druidism, Judaism, and Christianity. Under Christian hegemony, religio and superstitio were redefined as a dichotomy between Christianity, viewed as true religio, and the superstitions or false religions of those who declined to convert. Supplications are days of public prayer when the men, women, and children of Rome traveled in procession to religious sites around the city praying for divine aid in times of crisis. A supplicatio can also be a thanksgiving after the receipt of aid. Supplications might also be ordered in response to prodigies, again, the population as a whole wore wreaths, carried laurel twigs, and attended sacrifices at temple precincts throughout the city. See Auguraculum The origin of the English word tabernacle A templum was the sacred space defined by an augur for ritual purposes, most importantly the taking of the auspices, a place cut off as sacred, compare Greek to menos, from Temnian to Cut. It could be created as temporary or permanent, depending on the lawful purpose of the inauguration. Auspices and Senate meetings were unlawful unless held in a templum, if the Senate House was unavailable, an augur could apply the appropriate religious formulae to provide a lawful alternative. To create a templum, the augur aligned his zone of observation with the cardinal points of heaven and earth. The altar and entrance were sited on the east-west axis, the sacrificer faced east. The precinct was thus defined and freed. In most cases, signs to the augur's left showed divine approval and signs to his right, disapproval. Temple buildings of stone followed this ground plan and were sacred in perpetuity. Rome itself was a kind of templum, with the Pomerium as sacred boundary and the Arx and Quirinal and Palatine hills as reference points whenever a specially dedicated templum was created within. Augurs had authority to establish multiple templa beyond the Pomerium, using the same augural principles. Verba certa are the exact words of a legal or religious formula, that is, the words as set once and forever, immutable and unchangeable. Compare certi precations, fixed prayers of invocation, and verba concepta, which in both Roman civil law and augural law described a verbal formula that could be conceived flexibly to suit the circumstances. With their emphasis on exact adherence, the archaic verba certa are a magico-religious form of prayer. In a ritual context, prayer was not a form of personal spontaneous expression, but a demonstration that the speaker knew the correct thing to say. Words were regarded as having power, in order to be efficacious, the formula had to be recited accurately, in full and with the correct pronunciation. To reduce the risk of error, the magistrate or priest who spoke was prompted from the text by an assistant. In both religious and legal usage, 
verba concepta were verbal formulas that could be adapted for particular circumstances. Compare verba serta, fixed words. Collections of verba concepta would have been part of the augural archives. Varro preserves an example, albeit textually vexed, of a formula for founding a templum. In the legal sense, concepta verba were the statements crafted by a presiding praetor for the particulars of a case. Earlier in the Roman legal system, the plaintiff had to state his claim within a narrowly defined set of fixed phrases, in the mid-republic, more flexible formulas allowed a more accurate description of the particulars of the issue under consideration. But the practice may have originated as a kind of dodge, since a praetor was liable to religious penalites if he used certa verba for legal actions on days marked nefastus on the calendar. St. Augustine removed the phrase verba concepta from its religious and legal context to describe the cognitive process of memory, when a true narrative of the past is related, the memory produces not the actual events which have passed away but words conceived from images of them, which they fixed in the mind like imprints as they passed through the senses. Augustine's conceptualizing of memory as verbal has been used to elucidate the Western tradition of poetry and its shared origins with sacred song and magical incantation, and is less a departure from Roman usage than a recognition of the original relation between formula and memory in a preliterate world. Some scholars see the tradition of stylized, formulaic language as the verbal tradition from which Latin literature develops with concepta verba appearing in poems such as Carmen 34 of Catullus. The sacred spring was a ritual migration. The victima was the animal offering in a sacrifice, or very rarely a human. The victim was subject to an examination by a lower rank priest to determine whether it met the criteria for a particular offering. With some exceptions, male deities received castrated animals. Goddesses were usually offered female victims, though from around the 160s AD the goddess Sibylle was given a bull, along with its blood and testicles, in the Taurobalium. Color was also a criterion, white for the upper deities, dark for Thonic, red for Vulcan and at the Robigalia. A sacred fiction of sacrifice was that the victim had to consent, usually by a nod of the head perhaps induced by the victim Arius holding the halter. Fear, panic, and agitation in the animal were bad omens. The word victima is used interchangeably with hostia by Ovid and others, but some ancient authors attempt to distinguish between the two. Servius says that the hostia is sacrificed before battle, the victima afterward, which accords with Ovid's etymology of victim as that which has been killed by the right hand of the victor. The difference between the victima and hostia is elsewhere said to be a matter of size, with the victima larger. See also Piaculum and Votum. The victim Arius was an attendant or assistant at a sacrifice who handled the animal. Using a rope, he led the pig, sheep, or bovine that was to serve as the victim to the altar. In depictions of sacrifice, a victim Arius called the Pope a carries a mallet or axe with which to strike the victima. Multiple victim Arii are sometimes in attendance one may hold down the victim's head while the other lands the blow. The victim Arius severed the animal's carotid with a ritual knife, and according to depictions was offered a hand towel afterwards by another attendant. He is sometimes shown dressed in an apron. Inscriptions show that most victim Arii were freedmen, but literary sources in late antiquity say that the Pope was a public slave. In vacatio. I use. I use divinum. L. Lectisternium. Lex. Libatio. Libratio.
Libri Augurales Libri Pontificals Litatio Lituis Lucas Ludi Lupercy Lustratio M. Manubia Miraculum Mola Salsa Monstrum Mundus N. Nefandum Nephas Nephastus Nemuas Nunciatio O. Obnunciatio Observatio Omen Ostentarium Ostentum Ordo Sacerdotum P. Paludatus Pax Deorum Piaculum Pius Pietas Polisera Pontifex Popa Pericere Portentum Precatio Prex Prodigium Profanum Propitius Prepatis Pulviner Q R Regina Sacrorum Religio Religiosis Residential Divini Responsum Rex Sacrorum Ritus Ritus Grecus S. Sicellum Sacer Sacerdos Sacra Sacra Gentilicia Sacra Municipalia Sacramentum Sacrarium Sacrificium Sacrosanctus Salii Sancio Sanctus Server de Saello Signum Silentium Sodalitas Spectio Sponsio Superstitio Supplicatio T. Tabernaculum Templum V. Verba Serta Verba Concepta Ver Sacrum Victima Victimarius Vidium A mistake made while performing a ritual, or a disruption of augural procedure, including disregarding the auspices, was a vidium. Visha, plural, could taint the outcome of elections, the validity of laws, and the conducting of military operations. The augurs issued an opinion on a given vidium, but these were not necessarily binding. In 215 BC the newly elected plebeian consul M. Claudius Marcellus resigned when the augurs and the senate decided that a thunderclap expressed divine disapproval of his election. The original meaning of the semantic root in vidium may have been hindrance, related to the verb veto, vitere, to go out of the way, the adjective form viciosus can mean hindering, that is, vitiating, faulty. Vitulary A verb meaning chanting or reciting a formula with a joyful intonation and rhythm. The related noun vitulatio was an annual thanksgiving offering carried out by the pontiffs on July 8, the day after the Nani Caprodini. These were commemorations of Roman victory in the wake of the Gallic invasion. Macrobius says vitulary is the equivalent of Greek Paeonisian to sing a paean, a song expressing triumph or thanksgiving. Votum 
In a religious context, votum, plural vota, is a vow or promise made to a deity. The word comes from the past participle of vovio, vovera, as the result of the verbal action vow, promise, it may refer also to the fulfillment of this vow, that is, the thing promised. The votum is thus an aspect of the contractual nature of Roman religion, a bargaining expressed by do ut day, I give that you might give.